What's up, everyone? Alongside Travis Eldridge, I am Tom Eschen. This is Lacrosse Now, and the PLL season is here. The NLL season is just finishing up. Yeah. Uh, what a great time. I know with the college season just finished up last weekend. Saw Maryland win the title for the men, UNC for the women. Pretty much amazing for both sides. Yeah. Undefeated seasons, um, and that's really cool. So, But now we've got professional lacrosse in the terms of the outdoor game to talk about. Yeah, and so this show, we are going to do our PLL preview. Some of our favorite units, mm. teams we like, Players to look out for, rookie that may have an impact. We're going to talk all about that. Uh, plus, we'll preview the NLL Finals. And uh, speaking of PLL, we've got Marcus Holman from the Archers to preview the season. We go deep with Marcus. We talk about a whole host of things, including his career on the field and off. So stay tuned for that interview. And weddings. We talk about weddings. Lots of weddings. Wedding season. What's better? Lacrosse or wedding season? I don't know. That might wedding. be it. That they kind of coincide of the sometimes. They, they sure do, as evidence in the past. And one more thing. We'll also unveil our way too early Final Four. We're for doing the men it. For the 2023 season. We didn't want to do it. Well, I didn't want to do it, but we're going to do it. So we'll, we'll get to that. I told Travis Stay it would tuned. get some clicks. <laughs> But, so make sure you click on this show. So click. I guess you already have. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the PLL because the graphics up here and, and we're going to dive in. Favorite unit entering the season. Like you, we can, you can pick attack, midfield, defense. What unit do you like the most do of all the teams? I like the most. I'm going to go with the midfield of the water dogs. Ooh, and okay. I think you, this might be one of the more obvious ones that you see here. You look at who is on this opening roster for them. You got Zach Courier that leads things off. You've got Connor Kelly, Mikey Schlosser. I love Ryan Conrad as well. Jack Hanna joins the fold there too out of Denver. So this group really good. And, and you know, I love the way Zach Courier plays always has. And he's done it obviously in the NLL, and he's done it in the professional outdoor leagues for the last few years yeah. as well. Last year, 11 goals, led the league in ground balls among non-face-off men. He had 51 ground balls last year. Connor Kelly had nine goals a season ago. Schlosser had 12. Conrad had five goals, four cost turnovers, 11 ground balls. I'd like to see him take a step forward this year as well, be a little bit more that glue guy that we saw with Virginia. I just think top to bottom, this is a really good group Oh, you know, there's no really weak point, it feels like. That's running out of the box here for the Water Dogs this year. And even if you want to put an LSM in there, you got Ryland Rees. So it's a good um, one. He's one of the best uh, long poles uh, in terms of the midfield in the game. So I really like the midfield from the Water Dogs. I think they've got a lot of depth and talent across the board. They had a good regular season last year, the Water Dogs. They did, yeah. They, they put together a pretty good team as the uh, expansion team yeah, the last couple seasons. For sure. And, Obviously, the Cannons were that last year in one way, shape, or form. But yeah. the Water Dogs, I do like their midfield. I think it's okay. pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I like that unit. Uh, I'm going to go with maybe one that's a little bit more off the radar. I really like the defensive midfield unit wow. for the Atlas. Yes, I'm going there. All the short stick D minis. I got you. How about this Atlas unit? Because at the short stick midfield position, uh, we'll start there at the, the short stick defensive midfielders. Peter Dirth. Danny Logan and Jake Richard, all fantastic. Young, this is a young group, first of all. So I, I like the, the young legs in that d defensive midfield unit. But all three of them have been terrific. Dirth, of course, uh, coming from Syracuse. Danny Logan, what he did for Denver over the course of his career. I think you saw some of that this year. The lack of him really hurt that Pioneers program a bit. So I, I love having uh, the addition of, of him here for another year. And Jake Richard is more of the veteran presence in that short stick defensive midfield unit. And then as the regular midfielders, you got two-way guys. I mean, Brent Adams has been a terrific two-way guy throughout his entire career. And so he's a guy who's going to play some offensive midfield. But if he gets stuck on defense, you're not in, in trouble. And I think the same with, with Docs Aiken in yeah. terms of his physical presence in that midfield unit. Like, if he gets stuck playing defense in a league that where transition is everything, I'm okay with that. So I love the, the flexibility of those guys. And then at the long stick midfielder position – these may be the two best LSMs in the entire league. Kobe Smith, the rookie out of Towson, I think we're going to see just how good he is. Athletic. Yeah. Perfect you, for this If league. you didn't watch a lot of Towson lacrosse, and I did watch a lot of Towson lacrosse <laughs> over the last couple of years, if you haven't watched him, your eyes are going to be glued to Kobe Smith. Uh, he's wearing number zero for the Atlas now, so he switches from 26 to zero once he goes to the pro game. I think there's going to be a comfort level because he's playing for his high school coach, Ben Rubior, now professionally. So there's some, despite the fact it's a new league with new rules, there's some comfort there in the transition to the pro game. 
And his game just fits perfectly mm-hmm. with the PLL way of, of playing. Like, I mean, he can go end to end. He can shoot. The addition of having a two-point line is huge for him because he can shoot from distance. Yeah. So I love him. And then their other long stick midfielder is Craig Chick out of Lehigh, who I've been one of the biggest fans of uh, since he was a junior senior at Lehigh, was a cause turnover machine in college. He picked that up in the MLL early in his pro career and his transition here to the PLL. So I love both of them, plus the short sticks. I'm just, I'm all in on the Atlas defensive midfield. I mean, I think we could both agree on this. We're not making any prediction here for the season. It's kind of tough, obviously, with the NLL still going on. You don't really know what these rosters are going right. to finish out and look like just yet um, and until then maybe a few more weeks. Right. But the Atlas right now, on paper, look like the best team in the league. They have depth at, it seems like, every single position. They have youth, I think, at every single position as well. So they, to me, are the team to beat right now. For sure. I mean, you've got... Jeff T. That yeah. I mean showed everybody that he. I, I you know what? And, and the the crazy thing is, I was a little skeptical of Jeff T. in the outdoor game in terms of his athletic ability to compete with some of the best defenders in the world in this style of play, where it's fast, beating your guy. He proved me completely wrong in his rookie season last year. He was special mm-hmm. as a as a first year guy here in the league, and I think he's only getting better. Yeah, and then you got he got joining him a, a guy in Chris Gray, right? So that's, that already adds on to guys like Costa Beal who are, are part of this club as well. So I think that they have pretty much everything, you know, checked off. And they just have to win. That's, that's the end, what they have to do at the end of the day. And I, oh. love, and I love the dynamic in the offense, too, because you add Gray as another threat who can dodge like Teat. And that creates openings for guys like Eric Law, who's just yes. a pure goal scorer. So, yeah. I mean, if you're Eric Law, you got those two guys to feature the attack unit. He should feast this season just taking shots it's mouth all is do. watering just thinking about this. all right i'll go um now with our next category i'll start off here because i think it okay. um, leads in nicely with the biggest impact rookie okay and i think it's going to be jonathan donville with the oh, chaos okay and I, it's, they've slid him up to an attack spot yes they have and i, I think that that is something that's going to bode well for him of course Right now, he's going to play attack because many of the Chaos members are playing for the Buffalo like Bandits, the Josh Byrne, Dane Smith, just to name a couple. Um, but it, it feels like this is going to be a great opportunity for Donville to get, quickly, to get started quickly. He's going to have a lot of opportunities early on to get himself involved. And I think maybe we forgot about him a little bit in the college season. He started off really well for Maryland, wasn't as impactful late or in the tournament. Some other guys stepped up you know, when it was time to do that. But don't forget how good he was at Cornell. He's a guy with a box background, so this is a system that's going to suit him really nicely. And right now, he's going to have to be the guy that scores the chaos for the first couple weeks of the season. They don't have a ton on offense other other than Donville coming in, I mean, you look at their midfield, Tanner Cook, Kyle Jackson, Mac O'Keefe. Yeah, that's pretty good. All pretty solid O'Keefe can players. Score. Yeah, they can, they can score. I just don't know if there's a guy that I think Donville can now fill that role to be the guy. You need a creator. For the first few weeks of the season. So you do that to start the season. You get your name out there. He's a communications major. He loves the media, knows all about that stuff. So he's going to be able to lay into that whole mindset. So he's going to be on everybody's radar. So I, And that's going to help put him in the lineup. Not that, the play on the field more so than anything else. <laughs> but his play, I think, on the field, being able to do it early in the first couple weeks is gonna, really going to get him off to a good rhythm and get him involved early. And then he's going to stick in that lineup when everybody else comes back and become one of those interchangeable pieces. I feel like he's going to be flexible on that because of what he's done in the past, not only the box game, but also he has an experience going to a whole new team in Maryland. So for a guy like Donville, I think this is going to be a good fit and he might have a great opportunity to start the season. I'm a big fan of you using him as a communications major as a reason for his success yeah, in the PLL. Every, every, it ma- everything and, matters. I mean, intangibles. You got to look yeah, for those you intangibles. You got to look at those things. I mean, some a lot of cameras might spook some people, you know? You, you, not a, Jonathan not Donville. Not Jonathan Donville. He's, I mean, he might be a writer or something, I think, or he the, likes to write as well, so we oh, can okay. do some of those. There's blogs and vlogs. And anything else you can imagine. All the media. Wise. Yeah, there's, there's okay. cameras everywhere. So I guess that's we're something have to you get have to on. be comfortable with when you're going to go out and, right. and play. Intangibles, uh, communications majors, plus in the PLL. Uh, I'm going to go with another guy. Speaking of Cornell, obviously Jonathan Donville's former school. John Piatelli coming just out of Cornell. And I like okay. him with the Cannons because you look at this Cannons offense and – I, there's attackman. Yeah, and there's also <laughs> there's an adjustment that goes through you have to go through in terms of people playing with Lyle Thompson. We've seen this 
over and over again, whether it's been in the NLL or outdoors, whether uh, with, the, with the Bayhawks, saw it with the Florida launch early in Lyle Thompson's career. You can't, like, as great as Lyle Thompson is, he is such a unique player that there's a feeling out process. Like, you got to get people on the same page. And he's so unique that he's not like other players that people have played with. That, so there's an adjustment there. So I think here with Lyle Thompson in year two with the Cannons, you need, who, you need guys that can play off the ball because Lyle Thompson's going to have the ball in his stick, deservedly so. Like, that is the focus of this Cannons offense. So who can do something off the ball? It's like, you know, this war, the pieces in the Warriors offense in, in the NBA. The reason it works is because you have got guys that can work off the ball together. They move and cut. Lyle needs those guys that he can find. John Piatelli has been a terrific finisher for all the different pieces, guys that he's had to do, uh, play with offensively. It started with Jeff Teat at Cornell, and then you look at this year with guys like C.J. Kirst and uh, with Michael Long as the creators. He's just an off-ball guy. He had one of his best game uh, seasons of his career. He led the nation in goals with more than three and a half goals per game this, this year in the NCAA. And so I think the experience of playing off the ball with great creators in his college career is going to help him in terms of him trying to learn his way with Lyle Thompson. So I think John Piatelli could be be a key to have a big year, mainly because the attention is going to be elsewhere, and he is just a great off-ball mover and and a great finisher. It's going to be really interesting to see what the cannons look like on offense because it feels like Lyle Thompson and everybody else because you got attackmen running out of the box. I mean, they don't forget they drafted Asher Nolte. He's going to come out of the box for them. They've got Bomberry, Drenner, Frocaro, Nick, uh, Nate Solomon, excuse me, Ryan Tierney, all running out of the box in the midfield for them as well, which I think is really interesting because yeah. a lot of those guys, as we know, in the college game were attackmen too. Right. And but, even in the pro game. But you know what I like about some of those guys, whether it's for Caro, whether it's Tierney, they're guys that can stretch the field. Mm. I, I think you almost look at this like the spacing on a basketball court where, like, one of the problems with the Sixers when they had Ben Simmons before he went AWOL was that. The spacing didn't work because Simmons wanted to slash and Joel Embiid was inside. And if you take Embiid out of the middle, then you're taking Embiid away from where he's he's good. Well, Lyle Thompson, if everybody is working inside, there's no space for him to do what he does best, which is working one-on-one with his defender. So with Fercaro, a two-point threat, Ryan Tierney is a terrific shooter from outside. You add in Donville, who can move around the crease. I think that just spreads the, f- the field enough that Piatelli. the cannons – excuse Piatelli. me, Piatelli. Yep. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It spreads the field enough and gives you different – gives the Lyle options – to have room to operate, but then also find guys that, that can get the job done. Yeah, I, I think that it'll be very interesting to see how things work with that. Yeah. I think Lyle Thompson, you can only, he's a guy you stop and watch. So I think having Piatelli be a part of that fold now really interesting. The other two, On paper, it works. Yeah. I, I don't know how it works on the field, but I, on paper, it looks you know, good. You know, it's interesting because you have Nick Turner and Wisnowskis both with the chrome playing alongside Morrill, Malloy, Heacock, and Kevin on that attack unit. That's a lot of mouths to feed, it feels like. A lot of guys who, who you want know, the ball. Right? I think that that's, yeah. like, that's why I kind of strayed away, you know, and, and I feel like there's going to be, you know, some adjustment happening there. I think actually Nick Turner might have a better year than, for the chrome than Wisnowskis. I think I, I think maybe his style of play will lend itself a little bit more. I I, I don't know. If I don't Wisna- know. I, like, I don't know if Wisnowski is going to have the ball enough to do what he does but, best. But you know what? I like Wisnowski as being able to be an off-ball shooter too. Okay. I really I really like his shooting ability. I mean, yeah, I think that's yeah. one of the things that stood out to me about him at Maryland was. I mean, obviously he was he's good with the ball, but his ability to work just as a straight shooter and a sniper. I mean. He's, it's no, he's. I mean, he's going to be a tour Tom winner. So yes, I mean, we don't we don't know exactly what that'll translate into right, these days don't. because we haven't seen many tour well, Tom winners <laughs> recently in pro. Well, I mean, <laughs> yes, that's true. We are about to talk about the pieces fitting together with Marcus Holman from the Archers. Yes, so stay tuned for that interview that, yeah. because I he has, an, has some interesting ideas yeah. of, of how that works. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. Like I said, because last year you had. Jerry Bernhardt go play football and the year before, or two years before, you had Pat, Pat Spencer, Spencer go play, play basketball. basketball. So it's been a bit since we've seen a tour time winner out there in the pro game. Um, let's move on. Uh, yeah, uh, who's the player you think has the most to prove? I'm going to go with Ryder Garnsey. 
because he came on the scene after playing, what, one game, two games with Notre Dame the, the year yeah, prior. and just it, the tournament run. And, and we had seen flashes, of course, in Ryder Garnsey's college career. Man, this guy could be incredible. And then things went on at Notre Dame, moves on from Notre Dame, and then he goes into the league. And the first, league, first year in the PLL, and everyone was like, oh, my goodness, this kid's unbelievable. In 2019, 24 points, 14 goals and 10 assists. Played well in the bubble, too. In the six games, he had 16 points, 10 goals, 6 assists. And then the offense around him changes a bit last year. You know, you have Rob Pinnell come in, which changes a lot of things, I'd imagine. In any offense, for a good reason, Pinnell, one of the best to ever do it. 15 points, 14 goals, and an assist. So he didn't do as much feeding, didn't have the ball in his stick as much. So I think for Ryder Garnsey, probably has the most to prove in my estimation in that Redwood offense and being a bigger, more of a threat, I guess, if you will. He has to get maybe regain some of that 2019 form for not only himself, but for the team to also excel at the end of the day. They need his scoring to really be successful. I like that pick, and, and I think you're right. I think you didn't hear much about him last year. No, right after didn't. he came on, I was like, "Oh, Ryder Garnsey, Ryder Garnsey." And you're talking to him in the helmet, and uh, you know they're saying "Happy Birthday, Ryder," and he can't hear him. But you know, Ryder Garnsey's the main guy. He's the one with the helmet, the, the thing in his helmet. And I mean, I think you're right. We were talking like the mouths to feed thing, like with the Redwoods. Like, mm. I mean, there are a lot of dudes there uh, <laughs> in terms of mouths to feed, and you, you lose a veteran presence in Kyle Harrison, who's retired. So, like, I think this is a transition year for them in terms of, like, what's this team look like? Yeah, it's going to be interesting because Miles Jones played probably his best he had season. A heck of a season. Probably his best season as a pro, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, it was definitely his best season he was as a second pro. Second in the league in points. I yeah, it was say. unbelievable. Yeah, running out of that midfield and you got that Perkovic was, that's still in there. You know what? That was him living up to what I think everybody thought he could be in professional yeah. lacrosse when he was the first overall pick uh, back in, what was that, 2016, 2017? Sounds about right. I yeah. think it was 2016. I don't the exact year, but yeah, I think so. That also played a factor too. So yeah. that that makes things interesting. But for a flash guy, I think they need Ryder needs to have more of that flash for them to be successful. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's def- defenses adjust too, and mm-hmm. he's got to adjust back with it because you know when you've been the guy for a couple of years, well, people are going to look at you. And you well, know, the other thing is people hadn't seen him for a couple uh, that years that too before he went or into the pro game, and all year. of a sudden, yeah. yeah. But still, yeah, no, you're right. You know? Um, all right, I'm going to go. Who is the player that you think has the most to prove? So I'm focusing on Tom Schreiber here oh. for the Archers. Oh, But this is more of a Archers offense as a whole. I'm glad that Marcus isn't listening to this before we talk to him. We taped Sending. that before. I, uh, no, but he'll, he'll say, he'll be pretty honest about yeah, things that they need and to do so better. Yeah. This, this sense chills up my spine. Though. I, so Tom Schreiber has nothing to prove in terms of him being maybe the best player in the world. Indoor, outdoor, they, right now there are very few people that can do what Tom Schreiber does, and very few people in the sport, in the sport's history, have done what he's done. But this Archers offense has not gotten the Archers to where I think people thought that they should be. I mean, you look at this, if you looked on this, at this offense on paper from the time that the league came into existence, I, it was hard to not go, wow, that team is the team to beat. I mean, you look at Will Manny and Marcus Holman and Tom Schreiber, and now you add Grant A. Ment and all the different pieces they have. Matt Moore, Trey LeClaire. Get them in back there and go. And so I look at Tom Schreiber as having the, a little bit of the onus on him to figure out how to make this work. Because I think between him and Grant A. Ment, those are the two guys. Oh, I didn't even mention Connor Fields. He's also part of this offense, which is ridiculous. All that talent. So – how do you make it work? Somebody's got to make it work. And if I'm anybody, I'm putting them, my faith in Tom Schreiber to figure it out. So that's why I think he's got pressure because I think it's up to him being kind of the, I want to say the leader of the orchestra here. He's kind of the conductor of this offense. And there's been some speculations and rumblings on Twitter that he may be playing a little bit more attack so that he stays on the field. I kind of like that idea because you get the ball on his stick maybe a little bit earlier in the possession instead of having to worry about getting him on. Let him do what he does best, which is dish the rock. I mean, there are very few people that had the vision of Tom Schreiber in a lacrosse field. So let him dish the rock and get everybody involved like a, like a terrific point guard. I think that is, if, that, if this team's going to be successful, I think that's how it gets done. I don't know if it's his fault. I don't think it's his fault. <laughs> I, guess I think I, he's I, great, yeah. but I think the pressure's on him to figure it out. Right. Because, like, because like, 
if, but should he have to go to attack? It, it's worked no. really well for him when he's been at midfield but for they the haven't majority won. of his career. But he's won in other places. Yeah, but he's, he's won <laughs> what? One championship? Yeah, that's, that's still that's a championship. Ohio, no, that it worked, is. It worked but, over there yeah, with the but, Ohio machine with a different, um, a different, I guess, group around him. And that, but it was, and that is all yeah. encompassing. No, you're right. But I, like, you look at all this talent, and it just to me it feels like a waste. If the Archers have all this talent on the same field at the same time and they can't no, get it I, done. No, I agree with you. I think the Archers' offense might it might be one of the bigger question marks I've had like or my, disappointments that I've had. Like my thing like is if Tom Schreiber's really that great and you have all these great pieces around him, why can't they win? Like, What's the excuse? Like it should be the, the, the Warriors of the PLL. You yeah. should see them jacking up shots all over like the place. Like their goal numbers should be out of control. Goal. Yeah, and they haven't had, I don't think, statistically the best offense in the league on a yearly basis. And, and you know what? We're about to start to mark us about this. He mentioned the addition of some transition pieces, which I think is great. But settled six on six, this offense should be able to score. Like no defense should be able to slow down all of those pieces. They've got like five, six guys that could beat you one on one. I I do. I agree. I, I'm not telling you you're so, wrong. I'm just saying I don't know if it's Shriver's fault. I think it I, also I, falls on the coaching staff as well. Okay, that's I fair. Think that's a whole different I'm just, element. I'm just you got to be able to Tom put these. You, the you have to be able to put these guys. Phil Jackson putting all these stars in the right spot, triangle offense, and saying go. There's got to be a way to be able to do that. You, you we if were you're just, talking about this talent, like you got Pippen and Jordan, you got Ament and Shriver. We were just talking about NBA coaching. You said that coaching was not a big deal in the NBA. Yeah, because so is what Phil same? Jackson said was, here's your triangle offense, go. That was a perfect off-camera. We had a big argument. I said the coaches in the NBA don't do as much as you think. The players take a lot of ownership on themselves. That's what and I'm I think saying that here. The scenario. So you don't back me up here in the PLL? <laughs> so I think the you scenario you needs to be, here's your framework. It needs to be better. We need to get more shots off. And I, th- I really like the transition thought, move the ball. Yeah, six on six, you should be able to get more. But I think if... If they can get up and down, they've got the talent to, to beat their man, especially in unsettled situations as well. They don't just need the six-on-six. Six. They can be able yeah. to do it anywhere, anytime. It just is so surprising to me when you put all of those pieces on the field. It is. That I, they can't, that they have to figure out a way. It's not a knock on the guys because they are excellent. They're all great players. Some of the best in the world. It's just they haven't – it hasn't clicked yet, and I don't know why. And so I, that's why, Maybe this that's is why it's like I put a pressure on the unit, but I think Tom Schreiber's the guy – that like I think if there's anybody on that in that group that could help get it done, I think it's him. Okay, he's the he's the conductor to the orchestra. All right, cool. Not like he's got. Pre- I mean, he's proved everything he needs to prove he in does. terms of being yeah, a great player. I, that's for sure. I know. I you're, want to see him win. Okay, I, I you're right. The next step needs to be taken. I think as a collective for them to win. I don't know if I would put as like much I on look him. at this. I look at that offense. Like I mean, I you know like. The whip snakes run was great, but I look at that offense and go, why that could have been you? Yeah, in terms of pieces, like that whip snakes defense was terrific, and they they got I mean Matt Rambo and all those pieces offensively were awesome. But you look at the Archers' offense, and they had the ability to do what the whip snakes have done the first three years of the league. Yes, yeah, that's true. So they, they haven't they haven't gotten the job done, and there's there's other people than Schreiber I think that are to blame. Okay, that's but fair. That's just me. Uh, anyway, Probably. speaking of the archer, yes, let's let's talk to an archer. Yeah, how about Marcus Holman? He joins us now. So from the archers, we've got Marcus Holman joining us now from PLL training camp. Uh, Marcus, exciting time. How are the legs feeling after like a full week of lacrosse? This is like it's like ramp up quick for you guys to get into the season. Yeah, just just right into it. You know, it's year ten for me, so um, a lot of stretching, a lot of mobility workouts. Uh, but they're feeling good. We, we had a day off yesterday. It's, it was kind of like a league wide, um, off day for a lot of teams after we scrimmaged on Tuesday. So legs are feeling better. Um, and they'll be back to a hundred percent for our first game on Sunday. Yeah. So that best is a little bit different 10 years in the way they felt in year one, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just to be honest. Yeah, they did. You know, you never, when you're younger like that, you know, you can only hear people say, you know, just wait till I, you hit 30 or blah, blah, blah. And you're always just like, nah, that'll never happen to me. But, um, you know, father time is undefeated. So, you know, we still got some mileage, you know, in, in this body for mm. sure. I'm, I'm feeling good. It just takes a little longer to get warmed up. You know, that's all it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No, no, I mean, I wonder, like, you played with, with Kyle Harrison for uh, a while and in, in, earlier in your career. Like, did, 
do you like text him and say, now I get it? Like the nutrition, the the strength training, like it's different than when you walk into the league, you're fresh out of college. You're like, man, I could go eat McDonald's and play like three hours later. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm seeing some of these, these younger kids come in and, and do that. And it just, it's funny. You know, I try to, I, yeah, I'm, I'm becoming, you know, the Kyle Harrison and the, the Matt Strebels and the Joe Walters, you know, like those guys that were like, you know, you got to stretch and you got to, you know, watch what you're eating and stuff like that. So it's just funny how, you know, time, time goes by like that. But um, yeah, I, I like, you know, our archers t- team, I think is a nice blend of like, some seasoned veterans. We have some guys, you know, that are going on their, you know, fifth, six years in the league. And then we have some rookies and, and younger guys that are really uh, fun to watch and fun to play with too. So it's a nice balance um, are, in our locker room. Are there some of the older guys that kind of pretend like they are younger guys still <laughs> like, or they are still like, you're like, but man, I'm dying. You're good. You know, yeah. out there running around. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's somewhat of a mentality, you know, I'm, our, the quad that I have here is is Adam Gittleman, Scott Ratliff, and and Will Manny. So uh, Ratliff, Manny, and myself are this is year ten for us. For Gittleman, it's year twelve. Obviously, he's a goalie, so uh, not as much mileage maybe on the legs, but some more bruises just from mm. some more rubber that he's seen. But um, yeah, it's it's good. You know, we we've, we've all got our different ways about how to get ready, and um, but yeah, we're we're all feeling good and feeling like we can really make an impact this this summer for our team like that yeah yeah I mean you mentioned those guys and the three of them and you like not only on the field but off have been such good good friends what's it like to still have the opportunity to suit up with those guys professionally yeah it's 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 awesome you know I I think I try not to overlook it you know um I try to just you know I'm, I'm taking this day by day and it's you know, I miss being home with my wife and our little puppy, but at the same time, like these guys, I, I would consider them my brothers. You know, I got married in December and all three of them were, were groomsmen in my wedding, you know? So uh, it goes more than just, you know, being teammates with these guys. And I feel the same way about, you know, Tom Schreiber and Dominique Alexander and Matt McMahon, you know, guys that, you know, we kind of had that core group with the Ohio machine that translated to the archers. So um you know, it's cool. We had our first team meeting yesterday and I brought up the fact that, you know, outside of Connor Fields, you know, no one else on our roster right now has ever played for another PLL team. So like there is pride, you know, wearing the Archer logo. Um, you know, we we haven't had the success that we would have liked so far through the first three years of the league. But, um, you know, we still feel like we have what it takes. We've, we've got to make it happen. We've got to improve. And um, we're excited to compete for each other and, and um, have a good summer here in 2022. Marcus, and, um, you know, one of your former uh, colleagues, if you will, Davey Emel, just had another wedding. Are you going to have another one? Like, how many <laughs> weddings are you guys competing? Like, well, how many, what's the deal here? I think the, uh, the, the, the same person, obviously, Davey's married to that the other three weddings were with. Just curious. Yes, no, that... That was a, that was an awesome celebration. I was glad to, to be there. And, and Scott actually was, was a groomsman as well. So we were g- glad to be there officially celebrating Davey. Okay. Um, officially. Got know, it. Like I was joking, like the Kardashian, yeah. I don't know which one, but had about three or four. So just, he's just trying to keep up. Yeah. I might have a, you know, a one year anniversary, you yeah. know, another wedding down, maybe in a, another destination wedding. We, we did ours down in Mexico. So maybe we'll okay. go down to the Bahamas or something like that. You know, in uh, Davies, in Davies defense, there was COVID wreaked havoc on everything he was trying to do. The poor guy <laughs> in yeah. life. I know. Well, I think it was, it was like one of those things where like they had paid the deposit, you know, and, and all that stuff. Like we have all that money tied up. So, mm. you know, I commend them for the persistence to <laughs> uh, stay with it and, and get their friends and family together. And, and it was nice, you know, Davy and I were, uh, high school teammates. We were college teammates and we played professionally together with the archers as well for a couple games. Like um, to be able to see some of my high school friends and, and celebrate them was pretty cool. And to have, you know, their son, Anthony there, hmm. I think that's a pretty unique perspective for 
him and Catherine to have pictures of, of their little baby boy, you know, while he's wearing a tux and she's in, yeah. in her uh, wedding gown. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, congratulations to Davey and yeah. Catherine. Uh, I, I was, I was with them early on when they just like first started dating. We were doing a game down in Texas and I could tell then there was something going there. So uh, congratulations to the two of them. Awesome yeah. uh, celebration. Yeah. Hey, hey, back on, back onto the field for you. Like where's your game at? Like how has it evolved throughout your pro career? Oh man. Great question. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that if you want to have longevity, I think playing professional lacrosse, you've got to be willing to adapt and just be flexible. Um, you know, coming out of college, I was, you know, playing behind the goal a little bit more and, you know, I was, you know, having more assists. Like I think my, my goal to assist, uh, ratio was like pretty equal. And then, you know, you come into the league and you're playing with, you know, I was playing with Steele Stanwick, who is one of the best feeders, I think, of all time, you know, and you kind of learn like, OK, I'm I'm not going to be playing behind the goal as much with this guy. So then how can I be effective and play off ball? And, um, you know, and then Tom Schreiber gets drafted to the Ohio machine and it's another great fear. So it's like, OK, like I guess my role is going to be a little bit more playing off ball and, and shooting. But I've always kind of taken the approach uh, and, and how I like to coach attackmen is to kind of just like be a jack of all trades, right? Like be good at ground balls, be, you know, a good rider, be able to finish around the goal with both hands, you know, be able to create your own shot when you need to. Um, so I, I don't like necessarily like pigeonholing myself as like just an off ball guy. I feel like I'm, I'm opportunistic when I do have the ball in my stick. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just been, I've been so fortunate to play with so many great players. Like, you know, I, I think a goal and the way I look at it too, is just like, how can I make my teammates better? Um, you know, and if it's by, you know, scoring off of their amazing passes, like that's, that's what I'll do. So um, yeah, just being versatile um, and having fun. Yeah. I think that's a good lesson. Like you yeah. said, like as you coach, like for a lot of kids out there, that, or even to guys that are making that transition now to professional, to the professional league to say, you know, this is who I was in college. It's probably really easy for guys to go into the pro be like, I'm going to stay that same guy, despite the fact that the makeup of who's around you is completely different. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think you can, you can use the analogy maybe of like basketball. If you look at other, you know, leagues, like professional leagues, like there's only one ball. You know what I mean? Like there's six offensive guys, you know, down on our end, there's only one ball. And like, when you get, once you get to the professionals, like every single one of those guys was probably a ball dominant carrier in college or high school. So like, who's going to be willing to maybe shift their roles or, or, you know, spend a little less time carrying the ball and like do some more, you know, dirty work. Like, um, you know, you, you, you can only have, like I said, you can, there's only one ball. So like, guys have to find different roles. I think that's part of like the coach's responsibility to put those teams and offenses together. So um, yeah, that's, I, I think that is to your point, a good lesson for, for guys coming out of college, you want to play to your strengths, right? Like I'm not trying to say like, you know, deny your strengths, but <laughs> you've got to be willing, I think to, to fit and, and mesh with the guys around you for sure. I'm glad, glad you brought up the basketball analogy because there are guys in the NBA who like, make careers because they just fill a role like it's like yeah. hey we need a guy who can play defense at one end and shoot threes to the other and like if you can't do anything else that's fine you've got a spot on this roster and it feels like with you guys offensively like you've had so you look at your offense over the course of the first three years in this PLL and you're like man there's so many great pieces but does it feel like now maybe a couple of years in like you really have started to feel a way of like getting it all to work together to maybe it's ultimate like precipice. Like, have you felt like at some point throughout this, this run that you guys have had it all click? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the hope, right? I think move it. Like, I think the way we're, we're looking at it is, you know, I mentioned that core group of guys, we have nine guys that have played um, all three seasons with the archers. So like, we feel like we're upperclassmen and we're seniors, you know, and like, you know, the analogy with, with college sports a lot is like teams with, you know, the most senior leadership usually are, you know, the ones that are winning and, and competing in the playoffs. So like, we do feel confident that we know who we, we, each other are. Um, I think there's going to be maybe a little stylistic change in, in how we play. I think we've got some pieces now to 
get up and down and push transition a little bit more. Um, you look at a, a young, you know, LSM like Jared Connors. Um, we've got a couple, you know, D middies, you know, Latrell Harris, who plays for the Toronto Rock and Indoor, a kid, Jeff Trainer, who is, I think, UMass's all time leading midfield scorer. Yeah. Um, it, taking more of a defensive role for us to be able to push transition. And then a rookie, um, a kid like Ryan Algevin from Brown, who just has tremendous speed in between the lines. So, like, maybe, you know, we, we look a little bit different pushing transition and, and um, guys on the offensive end, maybe playing different roles, right? You might see me coming out of the box a little bit. You might see Matt Moore coming out of the box. You might see Will Manny coming out of the box. So like just kind of creating different matchup scenarios for, for different teams. Um, I think that's how you can, can be successful in this league is just kind of, you know, keeping other defenses, you know, back on their heels because they don't really know who to pull or who to shorty. So just being versatile with it, but yeah, we're, we're excited. Yeah, seems like uh, you got a good vibe there as you guys grow together. I'm just curious. I wanted to ask, you know, you've been with this league, you know, this PLL for a few years now. The biggest difference, would you say, you know, in terms of the league from year one to now? It's year four now, it feels like. A lot has happened since the launch for you from your perspective. What's the biggest difference? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think um, coming, you know, transitioning from, from the MLL to the PLL, I think, was, was a big step. Um, I think that the merger was, was also a really big step, you know, that now that we're unified kind of under one, one namesake for professional outdoor lacrosse is, is really important. Um, you know, I, I think at, at first guys thought it was going to be like this perfectly run, like uh, well-oiled machine and, and, you know, it's all glitter and, and gold and rainbows and fairies and stuff like that. But in reality, you know, like you said, it, it's a four year business you know, so there's going to be some hiccups along the way. Um, I really respect the, the PLL front office and, and Paul and Mike, what they've done, just listening to us as players, um, taking our feedback and, and really implementing changes, um, which, which is a lot of stuff behind the scenes, which, which the casual fan probably wouldn't know, but yeah, it's, it's exciting. I think that the deal with ESPN is, is awesome. Um, I think that just makes more continuity for, a fan that likes college lacrosse and already has the ESPN plus package. Like you're going to be able to, to just continue that throughout the summer and, and watch uh, the PLL. I think I just saw the numbers about, you know, the women's final four viewership and, and the men's final four viewership were, were pretty awesome this, this, this year. So I think just at its core, right. We, we still want to continue to grow lacrosse. Um, you know, as, as you guys can probably hear through my voice, like, I think it's just the greatest sport that's ever been played. <laughs> so like, you know, people all over this country, we want them to watch international communities. We want them tuning in. And, um, you know, the more people that have eyes on it, because as you guys know, the professional, like the college product is great, right? Like, you know, I'm not denying that the way I think we talked about Maryland before we started recording here, like how impressive they were, but when you watch the pros, like the speed and the physicality is, is, you know, next level. Um, and I think that's, that's what makes us professionals and, and it's going to be a really exciting summer for the PLL. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've said it for years. Like if you put, if you watch the MLL product before now the PLL, you watch it and like, then tell me you don't like lacrosse because it's so much yeah. fun. It's so fast. Like in the college game, depending on who's playing, like it can be kind of stagnant at either end. It, it's never the case professionally. Like it moves yeah. constantly. It's so much fun to watch. Yeah, for sure. And I, it, it's funny, just some of these rookies, like, you know, we had our first full field scrimmage on Tuesday against the Whip Snakes, and like it was their first real taste of the shot clock and like how quickly the possessions go. And, you know, Connor D Simone is like running off the field during a timeout. He's like completely out of breath. He's like, <laughs> this is fast, you know? And, and um, so it's, it's cool. It was, I think that scrimmage was a helpful adjustment for those guys, but yeah, to your point, like it's so fast um, guys are, are training year round for this because now there is that window where you can make a full time living playing in the PLL you know, doing your own lacrosse trainings and, and clinics and, and lessons or coaching at a high school. Um, so guys are taking it more serious. And I think the product on the field is, has never been better. You, uh, you mentioned your wife, Alex, earlier. I just have to ask, what's it like working on a podcast with her? Like there are creative differences there? You guys butt heads at all or is it all good? 
a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's no, it's, it's incredible. Um, it, it's, it, it really is fun to, to work with your spouse, but you do have to like set some boundaries and, and, you know, you know, establish like some, uh, um, I guess some like ownership of who's doing what, you know, who's writing like the preamble, who's kind of like planning the layout of how the podcast goes. So, um, it's definitely more challenging than just like a one-on-one podcast because you you've got, you know, it's two of us and usually we're interviewing either couples or, or business partners. That's kind of like the, the premise of the show. So, um, you know, sometimes I've got to bite my tongue, you know, and let her go and let her be the star of the show and nothing wrong with that. You know, I think that's, they say that's like the key to a successful marriage, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Is all, right. Uh, no, I've, I've learned like early. Hey, I met my wife when we worked together and now we don't work together. And I feel like that was a really healthy transition for us. So that, that, that worked out well. Wow. <laughs> you, you guys and your wives, man. What a world. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks, and and Davey. Congratulations and to Davey. Davey again. You know, another shout yeah. out for Davey. Getting married again. Oh. Cool. Hey, uh, hey, Marcus, we appreciate the time, man. Good luck. Uh, you kick off the season here on Sunday. Good luck. We'll be watching. Of course. Thanks, guys. And uh, appreciate you having me on. Huge thanks to Marcus for taking some time during training camp. Get those legs rested, ready mm-hmm. to go for Sunday. Looking forward to seeing him out there. Yeah. Archer's kicking off the season uh, here on Sunday in Albany. Yeah, and uh, it should be a fun weekend to start things off. Should be. Uh, two doubleheaders, Saturday and Sunday. It looks like the crowd will be nice, too. So uh, hopefully the weather holds out. At least here in Boston, it looks like it's going to be a nice weekend. It should be a nice weekend, so. I think. I checked the weather. Lo- yeah. cre- the, the lacrosse fans in the Capital District in New York are awesome. Yes, you see, like, they come out. They- and they yeah. came out for that Syracuse Albany game in the pouring down rain this year. Yeah. Earlier in the city. I mean, if they if you show up for that, I mean, yeah. Nice, nice Syracuse weekend fly, in June. Syracuse finally played in Albany. You got a great atmosphere and it poured <laughs> <Yeah>. on them. <laughs> what a mess. Uh, worked out well for the Great Danes, though. They won that game. They did. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. It, did, it did not Didn't, work out for Syracuse. Not well for Syracuse. <laughs> all right. Let's we'll um, see if they go back. All right. Speaking of college, it's time to look ahead. And yeah. And now to unveil our way too early final four for the men for next year. For 2023. 2023. That we're just, I wanted to do this today because we're fresh off the season, still on our minds. This is really Seven early. Good idea. We don't know Things, what the transfer portal really looks like yet. We don't know what the teams are like going to look like. It's, it's kind of weird, but there, we do know some things. You kick us off. What oh, I'm got? kicking us off? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, full disclosure, if, if – this clip shows up now like in two months and all these teams look different because people have entered the transfer portal or people have picked people up, then, well, this will all just be thrown out the window. But as of now, what we know... As of June 2nd... As of June 2nd, 2022, this is what my 2023 Final Four picks are. I'm going Duke, Maryland, Notre Dame, and Yale. So here are my reasonings uh, for each one of these. First, we'll start with Maryland, because despite the fact that they are going to lose a lot and they had to go in the transfer portal to, to get a bunch of guys, first of all, I think they'll probably do something very similar. And second of all, in John Tillman's tenure, if you've picked Maryland to be in the Final Four, very usually you're right. Nine of the 11 Final Fours that have happened since John Tillman took over as head coach at Maryland, the Terps have been in. And one of them they probably should have been in. It was the game against Virginia in the quarterfinals that the goal counted, that probably shouldn't have counted, forced overtime, Matt they, Moore. They lost the game, so they, they shouldn't did. have been in that year. They did, they, but they still. lost the game. But still, <laughs> 9 of the 11, and they were within yeah, one still, play right. of being okay. 10 of 11. Yeah, that's a better That is that's better unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> so, until Maryland starts consistently not making the Final Four, I'm just going to go ahead and throw them in there yeah. because chances are I'm probably going to be right. So I like Maryland there to reload off of this national championship winning team. I like Duke because I think there's going to be a chip on the Blue Devils' shoulder coming off of missing the NCAA tournament this past year. And I think some of the – look, they had so much talent the last couple of years due to the transfer portal and guys getting fifth and sixth years with the COVID uh, year that has been, that got put into play. I think the filtering out of some different pieces and – The emergence of some of this young talent as being the leaders of this team is going to help. I think there's just been a lot of cooks in the kitchen at Duke. Like you, it's just been a a revolving door of talent, and that's great. And we saw it it work out. They made the Final Four with Michael Sowers uh, when he transferred in. But I, I do think we started to see it toward the end of this year that Brendan O'Neill started to take ownership of this team. Like 
this is my team. I, I can be the guy here at Duke as a sophomore. And when he was the guy, they were good. Like, he scored the, I think it was, what, seven goals against Towson. Really had a good final stretch to the season when Duke felt like it was figuring it out. And it wasn't, they had not figured it out early. And that's one of the reasons they didn't make the NCAA tournament because they didn't figure it out early enough. And it took them a, a longer than usual to yeah, get it going. It did. So between O'Neill, uh, McAdory, Dyson Williams, they're all back. Uh, they got uh, Jake Naso still at the faceoff X. The defense is going to take some revamping, but those, these recruited classes that Coach John Donowski has been bringing in have been some of the best in the country. So I don't. Yeah, they're doubt. number five in the nation coming in for their new guys. Next, after yeah. they were number one, I think, in back to back years. So yeah. they've got no shortage of talent down there in Durham. So I think all of that will work out well for Duke to make a return trip. Uh, I like Notre Dame. Similar thing in terms of chip on the shoulder. The, the Kavanaugh brothers are back. Got a bunch of talent still on, the, on that offense. I think they return uh, four or five of their top, uh, either the top four or the top five scores from this past year. And I also like them as a team that may get a couple of grad transfers because of the prestige of Notre Dame and, and uh, the opportunity to play there. So I like them. And I like Yale because of what we saw. Like they, It was a young team. This past year, they return a lot of strong pieces uh, at that uh, up and down the field. I, I like them and to get back there. I mean, they were close this year. I, I like them to get back there in the final four weekend. Yeah, I'll start there. I only have one different team than you do. I have Yale, Duke, Notre Dame and Penn. OK, so I'll start with Yale there. And I think you have a bona fide top uh, tour ton contender in Matt Brando. That's where you begin, right? Yep. That's where you start. And you have another running mate alongside him with Leo Johnson, who had a great freshman year. Don't forget, he was such a freshman. You have Thomas Bragg, who was one of the best man up men in the country. I think he scored the most goals. So they had those guys in the niches. Jake Cohen, another one of their top recruits on defense, got a lot of time back there as well. He put up some stats. So you like what they're developing as well, along with their goal. So I, I think that Yale could not only be a Final Four contender, but a championship game, a title contender this time around, too. As they'll be older, a little more experience coming back. I then like Duke, like you said, for all the I basically agree with Travis for all the reasons you said. I think they're going to have a little bit more of a sense of urgency, and that's why I have Notre Dame in. Because yeah. Notre Dame learned the lesson that you can't wait a month and a half to really get going in your season. I know they beat Detroit Mercy to start or whatever, but they played those three tough games. And yes, they didn't make, they played a really tough schedule. But you got to win one of those games. At the end of the day, you have to be able to be playing well enough. I'm not saying you have to peak in February or in March, but you have to be able to see some of your potential early on in those games you schedule, or else you're not going to be invited to the party to get to the end of the year. That's what's the that's the, no bones yeah. about it. That's the the case with Notre Dame. I think they're going to come in because they thought they should have been in. Probably think they should have. They could have beat Maryland in the title game, and uh, they're going to come in with a. A lot of big old chip on their shoulder. I expect great things from Notre Dame in 2023. And I think they had some youth that emerged late in the season. And they have someone that we thought was going to be a Tour Town finalist in Kavanaugh. Yeah. You know, in the beginning of the year after his great campaign his freshman year. So they have a star of their own right at the end of the day. So I think that with Notre Dame, I said Duke. And then now you go to Penn. Penn. Yeah. What do you like, Penn? I think Sam Hanley is probably going to be maybe the best player in the country. I'm looking at the, the teams with the guys because okay. this was a year in which we didn't have that, right? We didn't really have yeah. four teams with the guy that I'm, was going to go and win the Tour Ton. I mean, championship weekend, we had one Tour Ton final exactly. playing. So it, it doesn't happen it, very often. It kind of feels like me to me that balance is going to come back and you're going to see some of these stars really come out. And Sam Hanley, for sure. They had a chip on their shoulder this year, Penn. Once again, so competitive and almost were able to reach that point where they were able to get over the top. I think from what they they had emerging as an, another – I want another Ivy League team in there because of what we saw as the season went on from t teams like Penn in which the freshmen all of a sudden, the guys that hadn't played in two years, yeah. all of a sudden things started to click midway through the season. They've got another year under their belt. They have some experience under their belt, and I think Penn did a great job of that moving forward here and going to 2023. I think that Penn can be that fourth team in. Uh, two things that you mentioned. I think, one, you talk about the ACC. I think something that else that will help Duke and Notre Dame is I do not see the league having the year that they had this year next year. I think Syracuse is trying to find ways to get better. I think North Carolina has 
they're going to have to move on from Chris Gray, but I think they've got some young talent that is going to continue to step they had the up. Top recruiting class a year ago, one of the top ones yeah. a year ago, not the top one, but they one of them. Couple, yeah. yeah, they and were then, one of the top five, I think. I in mean, the nation. and Virginia still has plenty of talent, uh, led by, of course, Connor Shelley. They had the number one be going into this yeah. year. Virginia has the top recruiting class in the nation. So, like, I th- so the ACC is not going to be what it was this year. I just can't see it happening two years in a row. I think they'll have more success than on conference, which will help. Teams like Notre Dame and Duke in terms of getting in the tournament and, and proving you're going to be a top uh, couple of seed. The other thing is, you mentioned Penn in the Ivy League, and the Ivy League team that I had that I was torn about, there's probably my fifth team in this list is Cornell. Yeah. Because we found out uh, right after the championship game that it sounds like Gavin Adler is going to be back for another year. That's a huge piece. Chase Erland's back in goal, and C.J. Kirst is back on offense along with Michael Long, who it really is – kind of the the party starter there offensively in terms of distributor. They got a lot of really good pieces back. And from what we saw from Connor Busick in his first year as head coach, man, he is a chance to be a special, special guy for that program. So I, I think I like what they learned. And now, first of all, the reason I don't have them in is like, as we figure out with all these runs, a lot has to align for you to get there. Like you look at all the things that happened for Cornell, Georgetown gets knocked off. That helps and they find their way to championship weekend. And I think they like that matchup with Ohio State early on, too. So, it's like, some of it's matchup and situation that help you get there, but they did it. So they have that experience. I think they will be right back in the mix again. I just like Yale in that league a little bit more entering the season than I do yeah. for now. And, you know, and I, don't have, I don't have Maryland in there. You gave all the nice stats. I just think that this is going to be a very – I know the transfer portal is what it is. But this is going to be such a different Maryland team than the one we've seen in the last few years. It is. And, and yes, it changed from it's Bernhardt new- to Wisnowskis on a yearly basis, but the core was still there. Most of that core is going to be playing in the PLL in the next few weeks. It's going to be a, it's going so to be a new look. A lot is going to be changed. We'll see what the transfer portal will do. I don't know if they can do better than what they did this past year in the transfer portal no, no, in well, terms of what they got. <laughs> that's why they were an all-time great team. Right. I don't that's think, what made them I don't know so for, special. Yeah. So I, don't, I think that the Big Ten also – will be competitive in that with Rutgers. I know they're losing a couple guys, but Rutgers will be back again. And I think that'll give Maryland some lumps around the road. Yeah, they'll be in the tournament. They'll, they'll be competitive. I just think some of these other teams probably developed guys a little bit more in the last couple of years, have a lot of young talent that are coming along, and we'll have that guy. Cornell or uh, Maryland might not have that guy just yet, and we'll figure out who that could be moving forward. Well, in the Big Ten, that guy very well may be Ross Scott from Rutgers. Yes. Who got them helped get them to the final four this past year they, they've got some pieces that they had in the transfer portal that came on that helped them in that run but Ross Scott's going to be back and uh, I that is something that maybe gives Rutgers an edge over Maryland in the Big Ten is that they've got that guy back Maryland's going to be searching a little bit yeah though there's no shortage of talent on no the no that they, they'll be fine yeah I'm not they'll be worried right. about Maryland at all I'm not working I'm just saying there could be some other teams that rise to the occasion for sure if you will there's, and it's a lot of guys it's a lot of culture I know the culture is instilled there but it's a lot of guys that had established the day-to-day yeah. kind of feel that, that have moved on. Every year's a new year. Yeah, that's a new group. New, group. new team, new group. How many times have we heard that from people that we've we'll, asked? We'll hear it more, too. All right. So there you go, our 2023 Final Fours. That's it. All right, let's finish up here. We've got an NLL Final Game 1 coming up this weekend, Travis. Who do you like in game one? Do you like, is it Bandits? Are they going to sweep? Or are the Mammoth going to give them a game? So we've got the Bandits who have not lost yet in the playoffs. Uh, Colorado's coming By the off. the hair of their chinny chin chin. True. But Colorado's coming off a, a hard fought three game series, uh, going the distance against San Diego in the West Division finals. We're talking just game one, right? Yeah, just game okay, one. We're just talking this, game one. These finals could go on for weeks. For three, so one game at a time. One game a week, three week possible. Uh, I'm starting. I'm going with Buffalo. They're at home. They did have. So you look back at the one and only meeting between these two this year. It was awesome. Yeah. 15, 14. Not a game that Colorado has played a lot of. Like they, they haven't no. played a lot of track meet type games. This they have one of the few. So for them, for the Mammoth to have won that game at home in April 15-14, I think shows you that they do have the ability to compete with Buffalo. So I think this is going to be a really entertaining series. I give Buffalo the slight edge. One, they're at home. Two, they're rested. And you look back at Dane Smith and, and what he did against Colorado in that first meeting. Three goals and nine assists. He had 12 points. Now, Ryan Lee was almost as good. He had seven mm-hmm. assists in that game for Colorado. I just, with Dane Smith and Josh Byrne, 
I can't imagine that Matt, I mean, we've got two really good goaltenders in Dylan Ward and Matt Vince in this series. I can't imagine Matt Vince having another game where he gives up 15 like this to Colorado. As talented as Colorado's offense is, is proven to be here at times this season, I just don't see him giving up 15, especially not at home. So I, I'll give Buffalo the slight edge at home in game one, though I would not be surprised if we're back in Buffalo in a couple of weeks in a decisive for a, game for three. a final game three. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the upset here in game one. I'm going to go with the Mammoth. Wow. You, you cite that game uh, about a couple months ago. Like the Mammoths showed that they could score with Buffalo if they need to. And I, like you said, Matt Vince, he might not allow 15 again, but maybe 12 or 13. And I have a lot of faith in Dylan Ward in this spot for the Mammoth to rise to the occasion and get the job done. Because when he is on, he is just as spectacular as a Matt Vince. Oh, right? for sure. I mean, he's not yeah. as consistent as Vince and has he's been. he's a little younger. But he, <laughs> he can be spectacular. And that's what's going to be needed from the Mammoth. And I think in this instance, in game one, the Bandits are coming off a couple of really tight games against Toronto. Could have gone either way. I think maybe they'll go into this series thinking, okay, you know, Colorado West Conference and, and not as, you know, we be back battle them once already. I, I just think the Mammoth will come ready. I think they'll be very ready to play in Buffalo and won't be intimidated by the situation. Because the Bandits, to me, that sort of felt like the team that was going to be this the, the, the team all year long. And I think the Mammoth have that nothing to lose mentality. It's like we are not favored to win. It's been the Bandits all year long, but we can be kind of gritty here. We can make them have to work for each and every goal. And I think Dylan Moore is, is the key and the X factor in doing that. It's why I actually think it works to Buffalo's favor that they lost in April. Is that like that was one of only four losses they, yeah, they had? Yeah, they didn't lose much all year long. Yeah. And so I think if you're the Bandits, if there was any worry about like being complacent in terms of hey, we've been the team, this is ours to win, it was the wake up call that they lost to Colorado the one and only time they played them this year. I think that. If there was anything, then if you needed to get your attention anymore walking into a final series, that does it for Buffalo. No, I think you're right. And true, that helps. But I think that there's going to be a little bit more of that, you know, free feeling. There's not as much pressure on the Mammoth here. They can go and steal one on the road. And I probably think the Bandits end up taking this series. I think they are the better team. But I think in game one, there's a different few seconds, sets of circumstances here that kind of get they, allows me to lean towards the Mammoth. By the way, I don't know if it – I feel like it didn't get enough press because it, the, when Dane Smith broke the NLL points record uh, back in 2016, it was like there was this big run. He came up just two points shy yeah. of his own record. He put up 137 that year, 135 this year. I mean, he was that close. The, this was a, another transcendent year for Dane Smith. He's going to be the MVP. I think I predicted that at the beginning of the year. I think you did. I you think were I right. did. You did a good job. Thank and, you. And, and that's not that – Big of a prediction. It's not a big <laughs> prediction, but I think I got it. Um, I mean, if, if they go on to win this, the Bandits, he will, you know, have that title as well and be able to, you know, start to implement his name as one of the best to ever do it in this league. He's to, yeah, he's starting to put himself in that conversation. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So go to an end 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. Yeah, should be, should be terrific. Yes, another ter- terrific show, I would say. So we got the PLL, the NLL this weekend. We got a lot, and we're going to react to it next week at some point, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll have another show next Thursday, so make sure you stay tuned to that. We'll be going back to once a week here throughout the summer, so we'll keep tabs on the PLL International game as well. So make sure you stay locked into your podcast feed or your YouTube feed, wherever you watch the show. But for now, he's Tom. I'm Travis. We'll see you.